As we gather on this Thanksgiving Eve, gratitude might be the last feeling or practice in which we find ourselves ready to indulge. I mean, let's face it, in the wake of a contested election and our awareness of the gaping divide in our country, not to mention in this year of the COVID-19 pandemic, with all its trials, troubles, and tribulations, and as a second wave of the virus appears to be upon us, as the holidays are a time when we more acutely experience what we've ex had all year, either our sense of social or physical distance or even absence from those whom we love, we might be struggling to give thanks. Interestingly though, 2020 has been a year not far removed from our 1620 pilgrim ancestors. 400 years ago, this month, the Mayflower Pilgrims made landfall at Cape Cod, Massachusetts. They stated in their Mayflower Compact, they established the Plymouth Colony for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. Their famous and demanding voyage from England was exceeded only by the harsh and bitter winter the pilgrims underwent after landing at Plymouth Rock. As their rations gradually fell to five kernels of corn per day, of the 102 pilgrims who arrived ashore, only 47 survived until the spring. At one point, only a half dozen, half dozen were healthy enough to care for the rest. Nonetheless, the colonists that remained instituted their first Thanksgiving in the fall of 1621. Back then, to the casual observer, it certainly appeared there was nothing to celebrate. Again, almost half of their company were dead. There was scarcely a person that had not been had had to bury at least one close family member. They still had little food, corn, cod, sea bass, some fowl, and many were still sick. And yet, after a time of heart-wrenching loss, our careworn and fatigued ancestors in the faith still took the time, set apart not just a day, but a whole week to celebrate, to give thanks to God. Why? Well, by way of answering this question, we're going to listen to another story, a story from the Gospels, from Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. Hopefully, it'll shed some light on the answer. Here it is. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at his table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. She wiped them then with her hair and kissed them, poured the perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began saying amongst themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the midst of a dinner party Jesus was attending at the house of a Pharisee, Luke focuses our attention on an unnamed woman. A woman apparently of some reputation in her community, well known for her sinful life. This woman, having heard that Jesus was in town, crashes this dinner party in order to pay Jesus a visit. When she arrives, she speaks not a word to Jesus. Not a word of thanks, not a prayer or an offering of praise. She says nothing, 
nothing at all verbally, but she speaks volumes through what she does. This woman washes Jesus' feet with her tears and her hair, and then anoints those feet with some perfume she brought along. Her every action, her every tear, her every gesture was a thanksgiving. A thanksgiving that flowed not from something she had yet to receive, but simply from her awareness of the presence of the one who was sitting before her. Her faith in Jesus, whom she believed was with and for her, in the midst of her circumstances, despite her reputation with others. Now, the host of this dinner party, a Pharisee named Simon, the one who invited Jesus into his home, he didn't much appreciate this woman's act of thanksgiving. In fact, he didn't think very highly of Jesus for letting her do this to him. In Simon's estimation, Jesus went down a peg for not knowing any better not knowing who was washing his feet. Of course, Simon never said any of this out loud. He thought it all to himself. But Jesus knew his heart. Jesus always knows our heart, oftentimes even better than we do. Jesus could see that despite the fake smile on his face, Simon's heart wasn't full of compassion or, frankly, gratitude. No, Simon's heart was hardened by judgment and self-presumption. In response to this, Jesus proceeds to tell a little story, to pierce Simon's heart of stone, to alter his perspective on the situation. We all heard it, a story of two debts, one debt far greater than the other, but both debts being unable to be paid back, and yet both debts being forgiven. Simon, in response to this brief little story, is asked to consider which of the two would be more grateful. And he answers, as we all would. He says, the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. Having answered correctly, Jesus applies the story for Simon to help him to understand what's just transpired. Jesus asks him, do you see this woman? And this question is as likely an indictment as much as it is a question, because of course Simon saw this woman, but he had yet to actually acknowledge her. In answer to this rhetorical question, the tables suddenly get turned on Simon as his lack of appreciation for this woman is paralleled by his lack of appreciation for Jesus. Jesus reflects back how he came into Simon's house as his guest, and yet Simon didn't even offer Jesus the common hospitality of the time, of a foot washing, a bit of cheap oil for his head, much less greeting Jesus with the customary kiss of friendship. Simon took Jesus being present, being with and for him, for granted. But this woman took Jesus being present, being with and for her as a cause for thanksgiving. As Jesus turns to this woman and says, your sins are forgiven, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Jesus isn't awarding or meriting this woman for what she's done. My friends, the gospel isn't quid pro quo, give the Lord his due, pay God the honor and respect God deserves, and the Lord will forgive you, save you. No, the scandal, the incomprehensibility of the gospel is that God forgives us, saves us, provides for us while we are yet still sinners. Jesus isn't conferring something upon this woman as much as Jesus is affirming what this woman has not taken for granted, but has embraced by faith the grace of God, which is given to all of us. Hence, Jesus specifically declares, listen to his words, this woman's great love has shown that her many sins have been forgiven. In other words, this woman's expression of her gratitude reflects not an expectation of receiving something, but rather her awareness of all that she already has been given, that she is seen and known by God, that she is accepted, that she is loved and forgiven by God. In contrast, Jesus turns to Simon with a grave warning. He says, but whoever has forgiven little, loves little. 
To be clear, it's not actually that Simon had little that needed forgiving. That's not what Jesus is saying here. It's not that you or I or anyone actually has little that needs forgiving. That is, little that needs conf- forgiving compared to the, all those really wicked people out there. No. The difference between Simon and this woman isn't in how much forgiveness each one needed from Jesus. The contrast between the two of them is in how much forgiveness each one sought from Jesus. Or to put this another way, the difference between the two of them is in how much each of them were living out of the grace God was giving them. One of them recognized in the presence of Jesus grace and responded with overwhelming gratitude. The other person presumed to be the host rather than the guest the provider rather than the recipient when it came to Jesus, and therefore demonstrated no interest in receiving grace. Rather than expressing thanksgiving like this woman, Simon chose to sit in judgment and thus remained ungrateful. My friends, the starting point of true thankfulness does not begin with how we perceive or feel about where we are in life. Real gratitude does not emerge from our possessions. It does not come from our sense of satisfaction or level of material comfort in any given moment. Biblically, thanksgiving comes not from looking at what we don't have, but to the one who securely and lovingly has us, the God who in Christ is with and for us. The key to giving thanks biblically is not looking at our circumstances. It is looking to God our creator who gives us life. Maybe not the life we want, but definitely, absolutely more than the life we deserve and always a life in which we receive exactly what we need for each day. You see, Thanksgiving requires a level of humility. If we think we've earned all we have, if we aren't acknowledging the fact that we received from another's hand, (laughs) then we won't be in a mindset to give thanks. It's a humbling thing. It really is. It's a humbling thing to acknowledge that all we have and all that we are has come from the God to whom it all belongs. And in this sense, thanksgiving then also requires a measure of reality. A measure of reality. It's having to realize, it's having the clarity of vision to realize, while our wisdom and work are sometimes involved in what we receive, From start to finish, every scrap of food, every loved one we hold dear, the roof over our heads that we don't even notice unless it leaks, that warm bed we assume we get to sleep in each night, all the clean water we drink without even worrying about becoming ill, all the health and prosperity we enjoy in the midst of other physical challenges we face and the relatively minor inconveniences we suffer, all those blessings that if we truly counted them, would take some effort and some time. These are all gifts from the hands of a kind and benevolent God. And that's all before we even talk about our forgiveness born of the cross of Christ, our assured victory over death thanks to the resurrection, and the promise that because of Pentecost, together we can become the best version of ourselves. So you see, biblically, gratitude isn't less than giving thanks for what we have and receive, but it is much more than this. It is fundamentally about not taking things for granted, or more pointedly, not taking God for granted. As followers of Jesus, we ought to celebrate Thanksgiving Day with more purpose and joy than anyone else, being grateful not because we are gratified, being grateful because we are beloved of God. We give thanks because we are loved by God and we express our thanks through our love reflected back towards God. Thanksgiving suddenly has a different meaning, doesn't it? Once we appreciate that there are others who were wiser and worked much harder than we and yet do not have as much as we have, The perspective that gratitude provides us, but by the grace of God go I, should soften and enlarge our hearts. It should quiet all our self-preoccupation and grumbling. 
It should massage our clenched fists into hands that become more open and far-reaching. In other words, our thanksgiving can never be passive. True thanksgiving is a responsive action. It is expressed. Real gratitude has legs. It moves from being an emotion or a feeling to becoming a demonstration through our words and our actions. I mean, think about it. People who give thanks aren't silent and they aren't often still. Thankful people offer smiles and hugs. Thankful people take a moment to write and send a card, an email, or a text. Thankful people look for opportunities to share their gratitude by being generous toward others. They tip. They tip not out of obligation, but out of pure joy. They cook and they bake, not because somebody's got to make dinner, but because preparing a meal is a way for them to express their thanksgiving to others. The reciprocal nature of thanksgiving is not about karma, doing good so that we might receive some good in return. No, biblically, the reciprocal nature of thanksgiving, again, is an endless loop that is only possible, that alone is sustained by the grace of God. Because God is good, we give thanks. Because God is good to us, we give thanks by doing good for each other. This is a crucial word for us in the midst of a global pandemic, a struggling economy, and yes, a contested election. I mean, right now, fear, fatigue, and frustration can lead us to self-protectively circle the wagons and only tend to our own. And while there is nothing inherently wrong with caring for our family and friends, we ought to be thankful enough for the ability to do so that we recognize that in the end, it's not we who have and will provide for our loved ones. It is the Lord who has and will provide for them and for us. And out of his gracious provision, our Heavenly Father assures us that there's enough, enough to be shared with others beyond our circle, especially those in need. In short, true thanksgiving reminds us that we are all in this together, that our achievements are never fully our own, but contingent upon a network of relationships that uphold and shape us. And that means no matter what divides us, the grace of God is greater, and it promises to both bring and to hold us together if we abide in that grace by together giving thanks. So as we gather around tables tomorrow, let us join with our ancestors, both in the history of this great nation and our forefathers and mothers in the faith, in expressing our gratitude to God for who He is, for all He has done, and for everything He continues to do through Jesus Christ. May we reach up gratefully toward heaven by reaching out in love and compassion towards each other, abiding in the Spirit's power, to align the vertical and the horizontal dimensions of our lives so that we together would reflect the truth of the cross. Because it's through the work of the cross, the God who gives himself for us all, that grace is revealed as the motivation and the means for our thanksgiving. And it's in war walking together in the way of the cross, following Jesus by expressing our gratitude to God through our graciousness toward each other, that God continues day by day to rescue, to redeem, and to transform this world for the better. Happy Thanksgiving. Amen.